you talk to just about any independent, honest a analyst out there, and they say you ran a fantastic campaign two years ago. The question I have is, what did you learn from that defeat, and what have you taken from that into this campaign, and is your messaging any different at all? Um, I've always said that I don't have a black message. I don't have a white message. I have a red, white, and blue message, uh, which is kind of the crux of our um, our forgotten farms and our neglected neighborhoods, our, our, our prosperity agenda that we're rolling out. Um, as I traveled around the state, of course, I was raised in Detroit, and, and uh, I, I've created jobs in Detroit. But uh, as I traveled around the state, uh, I really saw uh, how similar uh, poverty is, um, whether you're uh, in a rural area or an urban area, uh, especially when you take a look at the, uh, at the numbers right now. Michigan is number two for unemployment around the country. Uh, 17 of the top 25 uh, counties for unemployment are right here in Michigan. Um, yes, we understand that the poverty rate in, uh, in Detroit is at 33%, and that's down from the past few years. Um, but the unemployment rate is uh, in the mid-20s, higher than uh, the pre-recession. And uh, we look at the unemployment numbers uh, up in, uh, in Sheboygan, and they're north of 40%. So uh, we are really taking a hard look at uh, the areas that we are similar, sadly, and addressing the root causes of poverty and how we fix that once and for all. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead then. I did have some bullet points from the release that I got from Abby about this, this plan that you put out here a couple hours ago. Just a couple of the bullet points, improving skilled workforce training, college education, investing in education opportunities, all, all of the above education policy for children, literacy. Um, there are a lot of bullet points here. And I think there are a lot of people, things that a lot of people would get. My question is, yeah. considering where the deficit and debt is right now, uh, it was bad to begin with and has only gotten worse with the pandemic. What is your plan to try and pay for all of this? Well, the best way to pay for this is to have more taxpayers, right? To have uh, to broaden the tax base, not just increase the tax rate, to repatriate uh, opportunity because China has been building their military and their middle class on the backs of ours. We need to make sure that one, we do a better job of Americans of buying American. Two, sending people to Washington who understand how to grow our economy. And I am someone who understands what it takes to grow a business in a city that went bankrupt, in an industry that needed a bailout, in a state that was emerging from a recession. To create economic opportunity, then tear down barriers to that path to prosperity and increase access to that path to prosperity. That's how we begin to, uh, to, to get back and make sure that everybody can participate. So uh, this is an incremental process, but we need to make sure that everybody can participate. And then starting off uh, by meeting people where they are all over the state of Michigan uh, is, is the first place we need to go. Okay, I've got something I wanna ask about. You're repatriating the American dream in a moment yeah. um, and I'll get there. Um, I, I, what, I'm not going to make this whole interview about the president, um, but there are a couple of things I want to touch on before we move on. I understand, First, folks. Can't resist. It's okay. <laughs> that's it's part of it. Can't resist. Um, Go ahead. Um, the former Defense Secretary General Mattis. Um, mm -hmm. By now, I'm sure you've read what he had to say. He says the president is actually trying to divide us. He went on to say that he's a threat to the Constitution. You're a military officer. Very proud of your service. My question is, what is your opinion of General Mattis? And what do you think it says when someone with his credentials says what he said? General Mattis uh, fought very, very hard, not just for, um, for our ability to, uh, to exercise our First Amendment rights, but for his own. Uh, General Mattis' uh, words uh, speak for themselves. And right now, my words speak for myself. Uh, I have said for a long time, I can agree with the president without worshiping him. I can disagree with the president without attacking him. And my first and primary priority is Michigan and representing the issues that we have. There are plenty of people out there, pundits and politicians, uh, focused on DC. And the problem here is that there are not enough people focused on Michigan. And that is where I will put my focus and how we've been failed uh, by career politicians who have, uh, who have put their own personal gain uh, above the, uh, the benefit of the people of the state who've been failed for so long. Okay, the only other question I have, um, the, I read the Detroit News article again, where you said, I stand with the president 2000% from the fire campaign. That has been brought up by the news and especially by your critics. Every time the president says something or does something with which they object, they've trotted that line back out. My question is, do you at all regret saying that you stand with the president 2000% or do you still stand by that? 
So I was speaking specifically with the agenda of, of um, placing textual Supreme Court justices on the bench uh, with repatriating uh, jobs. Uh, of course, that uh, I'm, I, I don't agree with, uh, with everything that's said, but the way you deal with that is you deal with that the way that any respectful human being would. The way I would talk to you, Nick, uh, would I blast you out on Twitter uh, in public and embarrass you? No, I would give you a personal call. I would try to give you advice and feedback for how best to benefit the people of the state of Michigan. And already, uh, I believe that Michigan is in a great position uh, to, uh, to benefit by making sure that no matter who is in the majority or who is in the White House, uh, my election would make sure that uh, Michigan has a seat at the table in a manner that we currently don't have right now. Uh, look, there are going to be people on the left who are using the president as an excuse. The president's temporary. The president's been in office for three years. Gary Peters has been in office for 30. And there are precious few people in the state of Michigan say how their lives are better as a result of the time and trust that we've given to Gary Peters. Senator Peters has gotten, I think, what, maybe um, four out of a of 100 attempts actually passing legislation in the past 10 years. But he has managed to vote uh, to increase our taxes over 103 times since he's been in Washington. Uh, all the focus on the president is, uh, is to paper over the fact that they have failed Michiganders. And you don't have to look any farther than either Detroit or Sheboygan to see how desperate Michiganders are. And I would ask uh, Senator Peters uh, to answer for his own uh, record and uh, his uh, ineffectiveness rather than throwing stones at somebody who's just dedicated his life to serving his country in the military and creating jobs in the city of Detroit. I'm looking forward to bringing uh, the ability to represent everybody, normal people, uh, and uh, bringing my experience to bear to improve the lives of Michiganders. There's enough of this political talking points. We need to, uh, to improve the, the, the state. Uh, I would have six years, and, uh, and uh, that's, that's uh, I believe, it is fair uh, to begin this thing. Okay. Um, just today, Senate GOP released a police reform bill that would discourage, but not outright ban, chokeholds and no-knock warrants. Senator Tim Scott is leading that effort. Um, would you back that kind of legislation that does not specifically ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants? So I, uh, I need to uh, educate myself more specifically on a bill that uh, came out today. Mm. Um, I, uh, I understand uh, being uh, a black man uh, in this country. Uh, I step out and regardless of the, uh, the, the R by my name, um, I am an American who happens to be African American and I, I recognize uh, the, uh, the fear uh, that a lot of folks who look like me have uh, I understand that from a, from a visceral uh, point where uh, I, I get pulled over. And uh, I remember one time in particular, my palms started to sweat, my heart started to race. And I identified that because as a combat officer, I was trained to be able to calm myself in the heat of battle. And I asked myself, why am I responding like this? And uh, because my brain didn't recognize the difference between being in combat and being uh, outside of Cranbrook in the Detroit area. Um, I wondered at this particular point, if this was the day that my son was going to see his daddy bleed out in the street. I recognize what it's like to be a black man in America. And no matter uh, uh, how I'm living, uh, that doesn't matter if I'm walking around at nighttime with a hoodie on. I get it. Uh, but at the same time, I've been an officer. I've had to make a life and death decisions in a split second. I've had to do that through the fog of war. I understand de-escalation. I understand use of force. And I understand what's required. We need increased transparency and training, uh, not defunding the police. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, learning more about whatever proposed measure is in place and making sure that our local law enforcement and our communities have the resources uh, that, that uh, they have to heal uh, and to make sure that everybody uh, has uh, the, uh, the, the right to, um, to uh, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in this country, um, free from, uh, from fear. You touched on it a little bit there. Um, my next question is, what specific police reforms would you craft into legislation as a senator? You talked about more transparency. Is there anything specific that you would put into legislation that you would write for police reforms? Uh, one of the things that I would love to see is, uh, is an increased focus on, again, on data and transparency. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was on a, on a work group uh, in Detroit that studied uh, the a consent judgment uh, that Detroit was under for a number of years uh, at the turn of this past century uh, as a result of uh, deaths in detainment, uh, a number of uh, African Americans uh, who had uh, who'd been shot, a number of them in the back. Uh, Mayor Archer reached out to Janet Reno uh, a number of, uh, a couple of decades ago, and uh, a, a set of reforms were put into place 
uh, as a result of this consent decree. Uh, recently, I believe in 2014, uh, the Detroit Police Department uh, got a, a clean bill of health because of its, uh, uh, its uh, management awareness system. Uh, and, and that is, uh, I believe, uh, increased uh, awareness of being able to uh, uh, self-policing uh, of, uh, of officers uh, so they can hold themselves accountable and increase um, the, uh, the transparency with the community. And I think that uh, you're seeing that with how Chief Craig uh, has been able to manage uh, effectively through some very tumultuous times. The fact that Detroit is 84% black uh, has a very strong African-American leader and a police chief and Chief Craig. And the fact that Detroit uh, is using a, um, a, a, a transparency a software uh, system uh, that is helping to uh, not just, uh, 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 not just uh, save lives, but uh, to save uh, Detroit money. Uh, Detroit's another city that doesn't have the insurance policy and uh, anything that, uh, any money that they can save uh, in, in settlements uh, goes directly into, uh, into helping uh, 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 increase uh, the, the lives of, of, uh, of, of Detroiters uh, in increasing value there. So um, I, I, I think that that is something that uh, I would like to do a little bit more research into. Uh, I believe very strongly in, uh, in transparency and training and data and uh, giving officers increased resources to, uh, uh, and support. Uh, and uh, I think that's something that uh, that we could definitely look at. You uh, you uh, articulated uh, a few moments ago, with which I, I completely agree. Just being a black man in America, you have had a life experience that a white guy like me cannot possibly relate to. Um, have you been? Because as far as I understand, Mitt Romney is the only sitting Republican lawmaker in Washington that's gone to a Black Lives Matter protest or a demonstration. Have you gone to one, or would you go to one? Um, I, I believe that uh, there are a number of ways uh, to improve uh, black lives. And one of them is to elect Michigan's first black senator. One of them is to put somebody on the, uh, in the Senate who understands what it's like to live a black life. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, Senator Romney was doing what he believed was best um, to align himself uh, as, an, as an ally. Uh, I'm doing what I believe is best um, to try to get elected to the United States Senate to use my firsthand experience to actually improve the situation. Uh, there are some people who march, and I value that highly. Um, I was able to go to West Point, run a business, and marry the woman I love because someone marched for me. Uh, I value peaceful protests, uh, so much so that I swore an oath to the Constitution, including our Bill of Rights, to protect our First Amendment. But I also believe uh, that, uh, um, that, that we've been marching from, from Selma to Detroit. We've been rebelling from Baltimore to Watts and nothing has changed for African-Americans in almost 50 years. There are still areas of Detroit that look worse than the combat zones I flew in. And uh, many of those areas you'll see in the video that I put on social, John James MI, um, that uh, look the same or worse than when it was when my father started a company and he walked me down to McDonald's on his lunch breaks when I was eight years old. That's unacceptable. You have folks like my opponent who've been in a position to, imp to improve the situation for black people and all people who are in poverty in urban and rural areas for 30 years uh, as a politician, for 10 years in Washington, and for six years as a senator, and he's failed. He's failed. And so the best thing I can do to make sure that, uh, that Black lives uh, matter uh, and to make sure that we progress uh, the, the, the socioeconomic uh, plight of too many Michiganders, regardless of race, color, and creed around the state of Michigan, to address the socioeconomic anxiety that too many people feel, Black or white, to stop talking just about how we police people better in poverty, but how we get them out of poverty, is to elect somebody who has the experience, both as a Black man, as a combat veteran, as a business leader, to make sure that we everybody has access to the American dream and that no one has to live in fear for their life anymore. I want to circle back to your repatriating the American dream, and I know you're probably running out of time here. Um, as, I, as I read the op-ed that you wrote in, on Fox News, since like basically getting American manufacturing out of communist countries like China and back into America, um, one of the things you said, Congress must pass legislation to keep insourcing jobs back to our shores, continuing tax, tort, regulatory reforms, all vital to incentivizing the repatriation repatriation and retention of America's 
production independence and manufacturing energy agriculture. It's a hard word to say, by the way. Um, Forbes uh, is reporting a lot of companies already are leaving China because of the trade war, now because of the pandemic. My question is, if we get them out of China in certain countries, Forbes talked about how other countries like Vietnam in particular might scoop up some of those countries. So how do you get them out of China, but then also keep them out of countries like Vietnam or maybe Mexico and get them into America? Well, uh, I believe that money and jobs flow to where they're treated best. That's why I mentioned things like tort reform, uh, tax reform and regulatory reform. Of course, we all want clean air and clean water. Of course, we all want safety and equality. Those, those are table stakes. But I believe that we need to make uh, uh, focusing on uh, positive, economic, inclusive, and sustainable growth. And I think that by taking a hard look at, uh, at, at making uh, an environment uh, that's a pro-growth environment for all Michiganders should be a focus. And then also recognizing our own power. We need to do a better job buying American. If we really think of um, the components of our phone, uh, how much are made overseas, if we think about the components of what we wear, how much are made overseas, and then we think back to how, how much effort we put into making sure that uh, things were gluten-free and nut-free over the past 10 years, and we put that same effort toward making sure that we uh, repatriate jobs, and, and maybe it takes spending a little bit more to buy American. But I, I grew up in Detroit. I, I remember seeing tags and US flags on things. We were proud to buy American. Uh, and, and, and so I think that we need to get back there first by making sure that we do a better job of holding ourselves accountable and, and trying to buy American. Uh, and then second, electing legislators who are committed to making a more pro-growth uh, uh, environment uh, with, with regulatory tort uh, and tax reform that benefits all Michiganders. Uh, and, and then that's how we begin to um, uh, grow our tax base. Uh, and, and so we have more people who are able to work, make a living, and, uh, and have access to the American dream. Now, Mr. James, you've been generous with your time. Um, is there anything else that you want to touch on that we didn't already bring up? Otherwise, I can let you go. Uh, I'm excited for the opportunity to represent Michigan. And uh, I'm grateful for the, uh, for the chance to speak with you here today. Um, we have four and a half months and there are people who are hurting around the state of Michigan. I'm looking forward to using the blessings the good Lord has given me uh, to be a blessing to others. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to telling the truth, uh, getting our word out there and serving each and every single one of you over the next six years. God bless you. Thank you.